Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I um, always like coming back to Stanford. It's a really a literate audience, so it's, it's fun to talk to people who understand. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk today about innovation in stationary energy storage, and the subtext here is cost-informed discovery. And why I call it that is that uh, I started this work about uh, a little over 10 years ago, and I reasoned that if uh, the there was going to be impact in, in this area, the classical model of the university research wouldn't work. The classical model is invent the coolest chemistry and then throw it over the transom and let the manufacturing guys figure out how to get it down to uh, cost. And the cost will come down. But this is not like developing a smartphone that gives a utility that never existed before. You're up against deeply entrenched incumbents that are heavily subsidized. And if you're going to unseat them, you're going to have to invent in ways that consider cost on day one, not on day one when it goes to manufacturing. So I started with uh, cost information right from the very beginning. The other thing I want to say by introduction is I'd like to show this image. Can we get the lights down just a little bit more over here? Because this is a pretty image. And uh, it, it, it reminds us that electricity is tantamount to modernity. Everything that we value as 21st century world is predicated on the availability of electricity. And you look at this map, it, it tells you where the modern world exists. Where it's dark is one of two things. Either nobody lives there or the place hasn't been electrified. And if it hasn't been electrified, I can think of no more precious gift than reliable, sustainable electricity. Um, and, and electricity is special because uh, it's, it's unique in that supply equals demand everywhere at all time. So you're looking at the world's largest supply chain with zero inventory. And it's just, it's just incredible that this thing works at all. By the way, you know that this is a collage. This is not, this is not the NASA image of the world at night, because when it's dark over here, it's light over here. The world never looks like this. If it ever does, it's a really bad day for all of us. I hope I never see it looking like this. All right, so I had, uh, on the cost thing, I had one of my students uh, put this together. You can quibble about the, the exact numbers, but uh, the general trend is correct. So this installed capacity is a function of capital cost, and it's a semi-log plot, which means all of this means nothing. This is less than 0.1%. So all the batteries amount to nothing. There is no battery that can satisfy the needs. The only thing that really works is pumped hydro. But pumped hydro is geographically constrained. It's not going to work in downtown Manhattan. It's not going to work in downtown Boston. Uh, you need a difference in elevation. And you need abundant water. And even if you had those conditions, you probably couldn't get permitted today because the public appetite is such that they don't want you messing with nature. So I think the pumped hydro that we have in place now is what we're going to have. But we got to get something that can perform like a battery and priced at the point of pumped hydro. So, uh, so don't ask me about other batteries, because there are no batteries that work in this market. It's not battery versus battery. It's battery versus combustion. So I'm competing against diesel and natural gas. So that means electrochemistry takes on thermochemistry. It's an unfair fight. So you're going to be really, really resourceful if you're going to make progress. So what's my idea? First, confine chemistry to earth abundant elements. Now this is another semi-log plot. And you can see this is a relative abundance as a function of atomic number. And you can see these are very abundant elements, and these are rare elements. And the difference is one billion. One billion. That's really important to know. So that uh, if, if you want something that's going to scale in energy, I forbid my students to work in this part of the periodic table, because it won't scale. I mean, look, you can talk all you want about CAD telluride solar cells. Tellurium is about as earth abundant as gold. It just won't scale. If I gave it to you for free, it doesn't exist. The only reason I would study CAD telluride is to learn about photovoltaics as a surrogate system and then migrate over to something that is scalable. Uh, you see, silicon is the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust. So silicon photovoltaics make sense. By the way, this is why we all have phones in our pockets, because the semiconductor device of choice is the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust. If semiconductors were made out of rhodium, no one would have one in his pocket. 
Platinum is down here, by the way. That's why the prospect of hydrogen-powered fuel cell vehicles is so remote, because platinum is down here. Platinum's okay for the jewelry market, but not for widespread use in automobiles. Do you think if the world demand for platinum goes up by 100x, the price of platinum is going to fall? No. If the world demand for steel goes up, the price of steel will fall because iron is an unconstrained resource. Platinum is a constrained resource. If the demand for platinum goes up, the price will go up. So if you're working on fuel cells, what's the number one topic? Non-noble metal catalysts. So I say, if you want to make something dirt cheap, make it out of dirt, <laughs> and, and preferably local dirt. It doesn't make sense to trade in your dependence on imported petroleum for dependence on imported neodymium. Your dollars are still flying out of the country, and you have an insecure supply chain. And the second thing is make it easy to manufacture. I'm going to grab a second pointer. This one is, you know, the cobbler's children go barefoot, and I have the battery problem. Oh, well, they, they, don't need to, they don't need my image. All right, so the second thing is make it easy to manufacture. This is where lithium ion falls down. The lithium ion, why do they call it a gigafactory? Five giga dollars. What, it looks like a semiconductor fabrication facility and is really, really complex. And that's a technology that's 25 years old. So please don't tell me that, oh, there's so much more efficiency to squeeze out for after 25 years, really. All right, good luck. So you got to design holistically. On day one, you start thinking about what's that battery going to look like? Because if it's made out of dirt cheap elements in an elaborate design that no one can make reproducibly, that's not going to work either. So uh, when I started this, first thing I did is I disregarded everything I knew about batteries. I reasoned that the battery that powers this device here is useless when it comes to grid level storage. If you think you can take the battery out of this thing, take the dimensions, multiply them all by 10,000 and install it, it's not going to work. You got to look somewhere else. So I look for inspiration in my other field of research, which is modern electrometallurgy. And I look to the an aluminum smelter. You import bauxite from one corner of the globe, carbon, that's a euphemism for petroleum, coke, six, six and a half kilowatt hours of electricity to make a pound of metal, and the plant is about $5,000 a ton capital cost. So you know, 100,000 tons a year, you can figure out how much it's going to cost us to build a plant. And yet we go from dirt to metal for 50 cents a pound. That's why you're drinking soda and beer out of aluminum cans, because it's cheap. Now, Here's a modern aluminum smelter. This is about uh, 60 feet and probably goes back about a mile. There's a human form right there. That gives you a sense. All right? This thing consumes vast quantities of electricity. It's probably about 500,000 amps, 4 volts. All right? And uh, it was invented in 1886 by two men working independently, Charles Martin Hall in Oberlin, Ohio, and Paul Rule in France. Here they are. That's Rule. That's Hall. They were both born in the same year, they both died in the same year. And they met once, in 1911, when Hall was given the Perkins Medal by the American Chemical Society, and he rule came to Philadelphia to speak in praise at the banquet. They were fierce competitors, their patents crossed at the world court, they ended up cross-licensing and so on. Well, I told you they were both born in the same year, so I guess in 1886 they had to be the same age. 52, 42, 32. 22. Two 22-year-olds changed the world. They took aluminum from what was a precious metal costing more than silver. The Washington Monument is topped by a pyramid weighing 100 ounces of aluminum because at, before the, in the, at the time of the American centennial, aluminum was a precious metal and they had to have metal on the top to be part of the lightning rod and so on. By the time they finished the Washington Monument, the Holly Rule process had been invented. But don't forget, aluminum is the third most abundant element in the Earth's crust. If they'd invented this process for rhodium, it wouldn't make any difference. So I looked at this and I said, you know, maybe we've got the answer right here. So this is the inside. You see these posts here? These are the uh, leads on the anodes. So you've got a big carbon anode here, you've got a carbon floor, and the, the orange is the electrolyte, it's cryolite, sodium aluminum fluoride, 
and you dissolve aluminum oxide, and by the action of electric current, you make liquid aluminum here on the bottom. And at the top, the oxygen of aluminum oxide reacts with the carbon and makes CO2, and it bubbles away. So it takes a half a ton of carbon to make a ton of steel. It takes a half a ton of carbon to make a ton of aluminum. Only the aluminum is being made by the consumption of the carbon anode. So I looked at this and I said, OK, you can't run this in reverse because you have a fugitive emission from one of your electrodes. So I said, oh, well, let's trap the gas. Well, that's stupid because the gas is an insulator. That won't work. I kept thinking and thinking. And eventually, I came to the conclusion that you have to produce liquid metals at both electrodes. And that was the genesis of the liquid metal battery. And so how did I decide which metals to choose? Well, I was teaching a big freshman chemistry class. And I just sat and stared at the periodic table. And I knew I had to get a maximum difference in electronegativity. I did not use density functional theory, no computational material science, no rapid throughput screening, do-da-do-da. -do -da. I sat and I looked at this thing and figured it out by raw intellect. So I knew, <laughs> I, knew, I knew one of the electrodes would have to be one of the most electropositive metals. So that's going to come from the north west part of the periodic table. And the other electrode has to be a poor metal, but not a non-metal. If it's a non-metal, it'll be an insulator. So these are the poorest metals. They're right next to this staircase here. That's the uh, staircase of the semi-metals. So I'm going to choose one of these opposite one of those. And this was our first embodiment. It's uh, magnesium on the top, antimony on the bottom, and a molten salt in between. The magnesium is a density of less than two, antimony is greater than six, and the molten salt is around three. Now, metal, see, I'm old, it's from my, my electrometallurgy. People look at this and they go, wow, it's high temperature, you know, you're gonna burn the place down. They don't understand. You cool a Hall cell, you don't heat a Hall cell, you cool it. So the magnesium floats on the salt, it's insoluble, it's like salad oil and vinegar, and the salt is insoluble in antimony. So I don't need any separator, no membrane. It's primitive. And on discharge, what happens is magnesium wants to alloy with the antimony, but magnesium's insoluble in the salt, but magnesium's smart. It knows if it dumps two electrons and becomes magnesium ion, it can traverse. And then when it gets over here, it acquires two electrons and becomes a neutral and alloy. So the top layer gets thinner and the bottom layer gets thicker. And then to charge the battery, so these electrons go through the external circuit. To charge the battery, we force current through it and electro-refine the magnesium back, purify the salt, and purify the antimony. So when you recharge the battery, you reconstitute it to its pristine condition. And there's none of the fracturing that occurs in a lithium-ion battery with decrepitation, all this. Because no, it's liquid, and the liquid has no memory. And by the action of current, you generate heat, which is a threat in a lithium-ion battery. Here we trap the heat. I mean, this is just a schematic, of course. But we trap the heat. And when it discharges, it generates joule heat. When it charges, it generates joule heat. And with appropriate insulation, it can sit for days. But this is typically designed to be working on a diurnal basis. So you, know, you, you generate the heat that you need. And you might say, well, this thing's crazy. And of course, lots of people agree with you. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I've, I've persisted. So we have earth abundant elements. Uh, it's self-assembly. You don't think about batteries and self-assembly. You think about self-assembly in, you know, nano stuff, right? Um, now this is really important. People, people are vicious in their criticism of me. They say this is stupid. The, the thermal penalty is going to sap most of the electricity. No, the round trip efficiency of this battery, which I'll show you one uh, chemistry that's operating at 475 degrees Celsius, is 75%, accounting for the thermal losses. 75%. Pumped hydro is 70%, which is, I'm not going to say it's better than pumped hydro, just say it's good enough. If it's, if it's as good as pumped hydro, it's fine. And at commercial scale, it's self-heating. Our cells in the laboratory are tiny, so we have external heaters. We don't worry about thermal runaway. In fact, we've shock tested these where we actually mix the top layer with the bottom layer. Got a huge exotherm. Temperature goes up, but below the melting point of the steel can and below the boiling point of the contents. I once was approached by some DARPA people who said, uh, do you think you could put one of these in a forward operating base in Afghanistan? I said, yeah. And the other guy says, yeah, well, what happens if a sniper shoots at it? I said, well, uh, 
the bullet goes in the top, it'll alloy with magnesium. It goes in the bottom, it'll alloy with antimony. He says, yeah, but now you've got metal leaking out. I said, yeah, and it freezes. And the guy looks at his buddy and he says, battle hardened. <laughs> so oddly enough, a high temperature battery is safer than a room temperature battery. And by the way, you know, you can't ship lithium ion batteries. You can't even take the Galaxy Note on a plane. Huh? And you can't ship lithium ion batteries by pallets on planes. So we went to the Department of Transportation and said, what about this? And they said, so what's the voltage of your battery? at room temperature. I said, room temperature, it's dead. It's solid metal and solid salt. They said, no problem. Huh? All right, this is, a, this is a cutaway, one of the earlier. This is magnesium up here, and this is antimony here. This is a steel can, and this is probably about uh, what these, these are. There's your centimeter, so you get a sense of, of what it is. And you can see, you know, metal has very high surface tension, so it balls up. And then if you make it big enough, then it'll go flat. How do I know this? Because all of the plate glass in this room was made by pouring molten silicate on top of liquid tin. And the glass in this room doesn't look like this, does it? So I know it can get really flat. Uh, this, is, this is some candid shots. This was Steve Chu visiting us in June of 2012, and he autographed the glove box. There, see? Proof. <laughs> all right, so. Um, What's the status report? We've tested over 1,000 cells looking at different chemistries, uh, uh, different combinations of alloys, different combinations of salts. Uh, the database is really sparse. I mean, people, people study liquid aluminum, they study liquid magnesium, but you start looking at, uh, say, something like lithium plus antimony or lithium plus bismuth, either no data or bad data. Bad data is worse than no data. Um, and we've identified a number of uh, alloy chemistries that will get us below $100 a kilowatt hour for the electrodes and the electrolyte. And this is one of them that we, we published two years ago. And the reason I'm showing this is that you know, I, I'm tenured, right? Tenure means never having to say you're sorry. I don't have to publish. I don't care, right? But I do want to publish to launch the careers of the young people who work with me. So this one ended up in Nature, which is arguably the number one uh, scientific journal on the planet. And what that does for these people is red carpet treatment when they start their careers. But it also means that we must be doing something of intellectual value. You know, battery people, you know, the, the hierarchy of, of science, you know, mathematics, physics, chemistry, and then electrochemistry is the bottom of chemistry, and batteries is the very bottom, all right? But sometimes something good happens. So this is what was in that. This, is, this was the shocker that was in it. I'll give you just a little bit of science, because I want to get through this in, in time. So this is what was in that paper. So we looked at the, the lithium antimony system. And this is the data for solid lithium antimony. And these are data that were uh, obtained by none other than Professor Robert Huggins. And these data are fantastic. It's got a very, very good voltage and good performance. But it's, it's uh, solid at, you know, lithium, uh, forgive me, antimony melts at 630 degrees. And lithium melts at 180. So why are we, what are we doing up at 630? So if we alloy it with lead, it'll, the melting point will come way down. But lead is a low voltage system. It's a low melter, but a low voltage. Antimony is a high voltage, but high melter. So I said, well, let's alloy the, the lead with the antimony and see what happens. And I figured it would be sort of rule of mixtures. Wrong. And when you think about it in retrospect, we should have predicted this. If you've got an alloy of lead and antimony and lithium is coming in, the lithium doesn't distribute amongst the lead and the antimony. It bonds to the antimony preferentially because it's the tighter bond. So this is cafeteria material science. You get the low melting point of antimony lead and the high voltage of antimony. And that kicked open the doors for a whole bunch of other alloying things. And we said, wait a minute, this, we can start using these low melters. But we would have disregarded them. That was a surprise. So this is what happens when you, when you put this on a, a plot of normalized for the same amount of antimony. They lie on top of one another until you get to this uh, compound <coughs> lithium-3 antimony. And once you go beyond that, the voltage plummets. Look at this, this is fantastic. So being at Stanford, I know you want to hear about the, 
the, on the commercialization side too, so let's say a few words about that. So uh, I, with two of my students, started a company in 2010. All the catchy names were taken. So we had to register the thing, so we called it in a moment of desperation, the Liquid Metal Battery Corporation. I can't think of a more boring name. If you want a boring name for your company, call me. I'll, I can. And then two years later, we decided to change it. We changed it to Ambry. Why do we come up with Ambry? I learned that from somebody here. Cisco Systems. Where did that come from? San Francisco. So I looked at that and I said, we invented this battery in Cambridge. <laughs> and so I lopped the front and back off of Cambridge, and Ambry.com was still available. So that was great. So Series A funding came from Bill Gates. Now, I'm Canadian. I'm very polite. I wouldn't dare go to Bill Gates. Bill came to me. Why? Because I was teaching this big freshman chemistry class at MIT. It was too big to fit in the room, so they had to put it on closed circuit TV and spill it over into a second room. And then as the internet got more and more bandwidth, they came up with MIT Open Courseware. And this was one of the classes that went on Open Courseware. And somewhere around 2005, 2006, Bill started watching my lectures, all of them, every year. And in the August of 2009, I got an email from a woman who said she was his secretary. He was coming to Boston at the end of September. Would I have 90 minutes to meet with him? Well, I disregarded the email. <laughs> because I thought the students had hacked into my account, and they were just going to make a fool out of me. So I disregarded it. And then about a week later, she wrote me again and said, perhaps you didn't see my email, but Mr. Gates would really like to see you. So finally, uh, he came, and we sat, and we chatted in my office for about 90 minutes. And we talked about computers and education, the chemistry lectures, even had comments about the camera work and, and uh, distance learning. And then we started talking about energy. And, and I had no results. This was August of 2009, nothing. I sketched it on a whiteboard. And he said to me, you know, if you ever decide to sp spin that out, let me know. I'd be willing to put some money into it. And a year later, my students went to him, and he was our first investor and was met with uh, the money from Total, a big French energy company. This is an interesting story. You know, I don't know on this campus, but at MIT for a long time, we had a really, really strong movement of students to divest of fossil fuels, all right? Now, who was my first funder for the liquid metal battery? It wasn't Electric Power Research Institute. It wasn't the Department of Energy. It was an oil and gas company. So, think about it. All right, so this, this, is a, this is a cartoon that one of the students put together. This is what we're doing at Ambry. These are individual cells, and I'll show you a, a, an image of them in a second. So we're putting them together in pallets. Each one of these cells is 80 amp hours. One cell, 80 amp hours, they're a four inch square. And this gives you two kilowatt hours. And we had to invent all the manufacturing capabilities, uh, power electronics. So the thing that, that I find curious is that it's much easier to do this in animation than to do it in reality. <laughs> Actually, it would be very hard for me to do this. I would much rather do it in reality. But anyway, so, so this would be a 53-foot trailer on a 18-wheeler, and that would give you two megawatt hours, plus the power electronics. And we've had to invent all of that. I talked to GE, Schneider, Electric, uh, ABB, Siemens, all these guys. And I said, look, I'm an electrochemist. I need, to, I need all this power electronics. Help me. And they just said, wow, that's pretty risky. Let's keep in touch. <laughs> you know, the big incumbents, they don't, they're, not taking any, they're not taking any chances. All right, so this is a, a two, three years ago, uh, November. This is Phil Judici, our CEO. This is Deval Patrick, who was the governor of Massachusetts at the time. And what we have in the background is the um, robotics that help us build these cells. So we hired a man from the automobile industry, not a man who builds cars, but a man who designs robots that build cars. And then we figured out how to automate as much as we can in this, in this uh, thing. And this is what the cells look like. This is a 10 centimeter, four inch square, and the can is positive. It's just a steel can. This is a TIG weld. It's really primitive. And then there's a feed through here to make connection to the upper electrode. And 
right here has a dielectric seal. It's got to be hermetic, dielectric, and it has to stand up to the most vicious metals from the northwest part of the periodic table, magnesium, lithium, and so on. And that's taken us several years to solve, and we've solved it. Um, but, but this is 80 amp hours, and we've, we've now built them uh, 8 inches by 8 inches, one cell, and that's 380 amp hours because you get rid of all this wall, so you get more than four times the thing. 380 amp hours for one cell. It's roughly one volt, so it's about 380 watt hours. Now, for reference, this is a 18650 lithium ion, 18 millimeters by 65 millimeters on the same scale. And why does that mean something? Well, if you were to build this, say put one megawatt hour on 50 square meters, you need 93,000 of those 18650s. Now, I'll give them to you for free, but someone's got to wire them. You see, this is where the economy of scale flips. More is not better than fewer. We'd need 2,600 of the 8-inch squares. But this is the thing that really makes me excited. This cell has been operating, uh, this, is, this is early data, it's, it's way out here now, but this is, uh, this is essentially full discharge. Full charge, the full depth of discharge. And at 300 milliamps per square centimeter, if you know lithium ion, I mean, you've you got to put two decimals move over here. 300 milliamps per square centimeter. And the fade rate is this number here. What does it mean? It means that if you deep discharge this battery every day, once a day for 10 years, that's 3,650 cycles, you retain 99.4% nameplate capacity. We have some cells at Ambry that have been running for two years, discharging and charging twice a day, and they have nameplate capacity, zero fade. The capacity here is with an experimental error of capacity here. And there's, you know, there's a little bit of jiggle in the data, but there's no trend. So the, the, the electro-refining thesis is, is demonstrated. So this, is, this would be silent. It's not like a, a gas-fired turbine. Zero emissions. Uh, no moving parts. Remotely controlled. So this thing can act as a load. You know, sometimes to balance the grid, let's say all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of solar comes in and we don't have the demand. So you've got to dump electricity. So you call a coal-fired plant and say, back off by 5%. It's going to take them 15 minutes to do it. And meanwhile, the, the frequency is going to migrate and the voltage is going to go up. You know, every time you plug in your device, can you imagine if you had to think, do I feel lucky? <laughs> because it's not 110 volts and it's not 60 hertz. It may be 140 volts and you'll blow your device irretrievably. So this thing can, on a millisecond, turn from a source into a load. And then it can, it can take electricity at huge quantities. But the only question is, what's its uh, thing? So the first one's obviously going to be way over here. But our cost models indicate that at scale, we're going to be below $500 per kilowatt hour. So that looks good. But there's more. We've continued to do research. and. Now I'm looking at, uh, I call it Zebra Unchained, because Zebra uh, has the liquid sodium with the beta aluminum membrane, which is very fragile. We've got a molten salt electrolyte. And this is crazy. Solid nickel converts to solid nickel chloride, because if the nickel chloride dissolves in here, it'll attack the beta alumina. Most people don't realize beta alumina is really refractory, but not in the presence of transition metal chlorides. Transition metal chlorides will eat right through this. So the, look at the lunacy of this. You have a solid electrode that, on discharge, covers itself with a solid insulating layer. So I said, well, the problem here is we've got to get rid of this beta alumina and not replace it with another brittle ceramic. So we've been working on that, and we have some success. But I can't tell you about it, not because of IP, because when I went to first publish the liquid metal battery, it got, was held by nature for 11 months and ultimately rejected. And one of the reviewers scoured the internet and he found an image like this and he says, he's already talked about it. So I'm not going to talk about this. <laughs> so if I, but if I took that new zebra chemistry with the, the non-ceramic membrane, I don't have an alumina separator. And it means I don't have to just have sodium, because sodium is the only metal that will work with beta alumina. So now I can have a liquid metal molten salt on the positive electrode side, very fast reactions. And we've got some systems that are less than $25 a kilowatt hour.
because you're looking at things like lead, lead chloride with sodium on the other side or magnesium. I mean, it's really, really cheap. So that would mean that this cell would then have 240 amp hours and the 8 inch cell would have over 1,000 amp hours for a single cell. That gets really exciting. And the zero capacity fade. So I'm going to wrap this up with some general comments about uh, what I've learned from all this experience. Uh, first, you know, I, it's the power of, of, of free thinking and counter, counter intuition. Most people would say the battery should be at low temperature for high thermal uh, efficiency. But I reason to go to high temperature because I get all liquid and liquid liquid electro, forgive me, liquid liquid electrode electrolyte interface is fast. We have um, uh, current, the I0, the rest current density is 600 amps, 600 amps per square centimeter. There's almost no polarization. Scaling, I've already told you. Everybody says make many. I say make fewer, but make them bigger. And lastly, human resources. The people that worked on this were graduate students, undergraduate students, and postdocs who had no experience in electrochemistry and no familiarity with batteries. I wouldn't have them otherwise. They came with, you know, like you, bright young minds, unjaded, and don't know what's impossible. And they made miracles happen. The first year with our ARPA E grant, when Dave Danielson came after the third quarterly visit, he said, I give this project of all in my portfolio the lowest chance of success. Because they were all struggling. But after two years, we were getting results. And after three years, they worked miracles. So I say, go with the novices. And you got to have the right culture. If you put good people in a bad culture, you don't get good results either. So remember this one. If this looks like your workplace, get out. So I'm going to end by reminding people um, how it all began. It all began here with a professor, Volta, at the University of Padua. This is his first battery. It's a stack of coins, silver and zinc, separated by cardboard soaked in brine. And this gave birth to a new field of science, electrochemistry, it actually gave birth to electricity. There was no electricity before this. The dynamo was invented 60 years later. But this was the birth of electricity. So all the guys that did electromagnetism in the 1830s and 1840s, they were working with this. This Volta gave us the new field, and immediately, within 10 years, there was new technology, electroplating, electroforming and then form the basis for electrolytic production of metals. The second thing that Volta's discovery did is that for the first time it demonstrated the utility of a professor. <laughs> Until Volta, no one believed a professor could be of any use. But Volta showed that if you give a professor uh, resources and good people and leave him alone, he's liable to do something of societal value. And Everybody who does sponsored research is following in Volta's footsteps. Before Volta, all advances in the science came not from the science. It came from the artisan. People knew how to color glass with glazes before a professor could give a mediocre lecture on band gaps. And, huh? and people knew how to make a, a tempered sword long before a professor could give a, a mediocre lecture on phase transformations in metal. But Volta changed that. Volta invented it at the university, and then it spread. And that's what we do here. Thank you. OK, we have uh, time for some questions. And uh, in keeping with the uh, custom, uh, I'd like to begin by encouraging uh, and actually requiring uh, questions from students in the audience, please. Yes. Um, I've like been following you on Twitter for a while. I'm curious. You talk a little bit about electricity, electricity storage, and spreading electricity because with electricity comes education and ability to spread all the good things about modern uh, modern life. I remember one time you mentioned something about hydro, like hydropower, 
uh, three waves. I was wondering if you ever had any thoughts towards how do you take wave power and use it to both provide electricity and possibly like clean water to places that don't necessarily have it. Have you ever thought about that way? Well, uh, you know, I think that uh, if, if you start with uh, water that needs to be purified to make it potable, then, uh, you know, I start thinking electrochemically because the, uh, it's 540 calories per gram to evaporate it and then condense it and so on. You can do it, um, but uh, I, I, would, I would like to see uh, electricity generated sustainably and then use that to, to purify water because if you got energy, if you got energy, you know, you can read after dark. That means you can educate yourself. And if you can drink the water and not, not be uh, ill-disposed, uh, that's, that's the ingredients to a good start. Yes? Uh, thanks for the uh, very exciting talk. So my question would be, uh, would you please teach me more about the, the packaging material and the sealing material that you choose to make your better pack uh, that can be uh, capable to manage the heat and also of lower cost? and also to maintain the safety requirement. So the first thing, the packaging, it's in a, uh, it's in a steel can. It's all steel. Um, and then the, the, the dielectric at the top is a, is a combination of, of uh, oxide ceramic and uh, there's some titanium nitride in there that is uh, especially corrosion resistant to the vapor in the head space. And, and it's a design that, uh, you know, so you have to design it in such a way because it's going to undergo a thermal excursion. And ceramics are okay in compression. They're no good in tension. So when this thing is going to expand as it rises in temperature, you have to design it in such a way that the ceramic is inside a collar so that the, that the two metals uh, expand and then compress the ceramic. So there's all these uh, tricks and so on. And then as far as safety goes, um, is we keep the thing sealed, of course, but uh, you know, as I said in my remarks, the the high temperature, uh, it's oh, I, I remember you asked me about insulation. So insulation, we've calculated what we need, and we don't use solid insulation like bricks, but we use a powdered, uh, uh, flowable ceramic and put that around. But even things like the interconnects, the interconnects at 475 degrees Celsius can't be copper. Copper at 475 will oxidize. So what are we going to use? Well, we, in the early prototypes, we were using nickel. Nickel works, but it's frightfully expensive. So I said, well, let's use something that's a lot cheaper. So I said, well, copper, we'll put about 10% aluminum in it. We made an aluminum bronze. Aluminum oxide forms on the surface of the copper, and it works. But what we're doing next is research on lower melting metals and lower melting salts. If we get down, it's, it's, it's an Arrhenius plot, right, to, uh, in terms of corrosion activity. But there are click stops on there. If you get down below 280, all of a sudden you use copper. And if you get down below 250, you don't use steel. You can use polymer. Can you imagine using injection molded, molded polymer for the can? And the seal is going to be a compression fitting. I mean, just goes lower and lower. And the limit is not the metals. There are plenty of low melting metals, but there aren't very many low melting salts. And don't talk to me about ionic liquids because they're frightfully expensive and their electrical conductivities are abysmally low. So they, they, they're not going to help you here. We got to get a low melting salts. And that's what we're working on. Right back there, yes. Uh, are there, uh, as you look forward to the commercialization of this technology, do you see major policy or regulatory structures in, in electricity markets that might prevent uh, the full value of these batteries from being realized? Yes. Yes. So the, the, the original grid did not anticipate the need for storage. And, you know, if you and I started a, an oil company, that company could explore, drill, pump, refine, make product, and sell to the consumer. In electricity, the people who generate electricity don't transmit it. The people who transmit it don't distribute it. The people who distribute it don't sell to the rate payer. So the, 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 it's all fractionated like this. So I come along with storage, and where would it do the most good? Well, let's say I'm a generator, and the, the, the guy who's transmitting wants to install storage so he doesn't have to put in a new transmission line. 
When the battery's discharging, it's tantamount to a generator. So I'll protest and say, you don't have the right to, to uh, have a battery. So th th there's, there's a lot of, of policy uh, changes and regulatory changes that are going to have to take place. But it's, you know, if I asked you in 1985, could you, uh, could you construct for me just the roughly, how would you price uh, wireless transmission of digital data? You go, what? I don't know what you're talking about. So we're at the same point with this. People, people have never anticipated this. So, but you, you've, you've touched on a, a key point that this is not a free market. If you and I come up with a new toothpaste, they put it on the shelves. If people want it, they buy it, right? But if you come out with something in the energy, it's so, it's so complex and regulated and so on. You show up with a superior technology, they, they don't greet you with flowers. They said, what are you doing here? You're going you're gonna to obsolete all this stuff. But, you know, the other thing about the grid, you're mandated to meet peak demand. Peak demand is 40% higher than normal, and it's reached less than 2% of time. So if, if I told you you have to build your highway that way, all of these highways would be 25 lanes wide so that no one would ever have to hit the brakes because you have to meet peak demand. We say, that's stupid, but that's the way the grid is. So it's... It's, if, if you can have batteries that'll shave those peaks off, it's huge. So it's not just about firming renewables, you know. Intermittent renewables are a headache. They're not a blessing. Marginal uh, power at zero marginal cost in excess of demand is useless because you can't catch it. It's not like extra rain. You know, imagine, imagine the food supply chain without refrigeration. Food supply chain without refrigeration means you eat what is locally available. You don't have stuff coming from halfway around the world. There's, a, well, there's one other way out of this, by the way. I showed you that image of the world all over the place, and I said, well, it's sunny here, but it's dark over there. Well, what's the other remedy? Lossless transmission of electricity. So... If you're looking for a project, I challenge you. Room temperature superconductivity. With room temperature superconductivity, I could ship electricity from where the sun shines to where it's dark, and I could balance the grid really well. That's a long shot, but it's worth trying for. Okay, uh, we'll take one more quick student question and then we'll... Yeah. Okay, what's the vapor pressure change of the battery during the charge and discharge? Well, the vapor pressure, uh, the vapor pressure change is going to be in the head space, but we don't fully deplete the, the metal out of the, the head space. So the, the, the vapor pressure actually doesn't change in the head space. And then the salt is covered over the, uh, the metal on the bottom. The metal on the bottom is the low volatile one. It's, it's not a, we're not talking about uh, high pressure or anything like that. These are all sub-atmospheric pressures. So I'm thinking about uh, you know, power wall or something like that, yeah. just say an order of magnitude or more, more expensive than what you have. What is the right scale? If, if you have a community, should, and, and people have solar roofs, or should, should every home have one of these batteries, or should there be one for a, a block or one for a whole city? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It, it's going to come down to... Uh, how the economics shake out. I mean, you know, pe people have this uh, idea that it'd be great to have a solar panel on a roof and, and storage in their own basement and essentially be off-grid. Um, I think the economy of scale works better for a neighborhood. And because, you know, the, the grid is not going to go away. So if, if you had neighborhood-level storage, then you could have uh, electrical devices. See, right now, the reason that they will not allow you to take the uh, electricity off your roof and take it into your house, they, have, they, they force you to p send it through the grid because the grid has to know in order to balance supply and demand. So they can't have all this stuff going on without their knowledge. That's true up to a point, but you could have electronic devices that, uh, let's say you want to sell electricity to the grid. It sends a note 
And then it says, requesting permission to sell. What's the price? And then it sends you back a note saying, okay, we can accept it. I know it's coming. And but, but they don't, they don't, they choose, this goes back to the point of the young lady over there about regulatory issues. You know, after Superstorm Sandy, they had all these luxury homes along the Jersey Shore with uh, panels on the roof and it's sunny day two days after the storm and the electricity goes to the grid, but the grid is down. So let's fix that. Those are man-made rules. They can be changed. All right? A follow-up question on the heat. The, the video, the packaging, yeah. left the impression that I could walk right up and just touch the edge of that box, no problem. Is that the case? Yes. Or you don't need a special in, uh, machinery room or any of that stuff? Well, the, you, you saw the, uh, the one with the white the white outer panel. So we've got, those are built and the, there's insulation between the aggregation of the metal cells and the outside. The outside is, I don't know what the spec is, it has to be below 50 degrees C or something like that. So that's fine. Cause, cause, and, and by the way, people ask, well what happens if they, they start to freeze? They freeze from the outside in. They don't freeze uniformly. So they start freezing slowly, slowly, slowly. As long as the ones in the center are still molten, you start passing current and it melts back. Thank you. See a question back there? Yeah, Professor, you, I heard you talk about the lithium ion. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the effect of uh, vanadium flow batteries? Because those are the ones that are commercially available today. Uh, and I haven't seen that uh, mentioned in any of your charts. Well, there, there was a, a point on the, the the chart of the flow batteries. They've, they've been around for about 40 years. People are struggling to, to make them uh, uh, practical. And uh, I, I, I'm happy to see, it's not battery versus battery. I mean, you know, if the power wall can, can contribute good, if the, somebody can get flow batteries to work, fine. I, I'm not gonna get tribal here. Personally, I, I, I don't work in aqueous solutions. Water is, for drinking, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't, me, for me, aqueous electrochemistry is boring. But, you know, I don't, so I don't know, I don't know how close the flow batteries are. But my one, my one question about flow batteries is, how is the flow induced? <clears throat> pumps, those pumps are moving parts. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta factor that in the cost of ownership. I ask people, how long is the flow battery? Like, oh, 30 years. I said. How about the pumps? Do you have to do anything? Oh yeah, we have to replace some of the veins and the pumps and so on. And how often do you have to do that? Well, you know, so maybe that's the reason that they're not out there. I don't know. Okay, I think that's it for the uh, general question period. There may be some opportunity to ask some questions to Don afterward, but uh, in any case, let's thank him for an excellent seminar. <laughs>